Hey, I'm Aisha. You can now watch UCF TV 24 hours a day on Bright House Digital Channel 1. Thank you very much for that uh, lovely introduction. Thank you for reading it exactly the way I wrote it. I appreciate that <laughs> very much. Uh, um, I am from Washington and here to help you <laughs> this afternoon. <clears throat> um, actually, uh, you, you missed a part. It's OK. It's uh, no problem about that introduction. It's. Um, I, um, I actually began my career in journalism a long time ago, um, uh, working for the Miami Herald, uh, where I was a general assignment reporter. Uh, that meant that I covered crime, <laughs> meaning no offense to any of you who may be from Miami, that's an excellent place to cover crime. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I had a specialty, I covered murders. I covered single murders and double murders and triple murders. Um, I once covered a double murder in my own apartment complex. That's how I got to meet everyone. <laughs> I walked up and down the hallways and knocked on the doors and said, hello, I'm Jeff Birnbaum. Uh, I work for the Miami Herald and I live right here in the apartment complex. Uh, did you hear a scream on Friday night? <clears throat> that made me notorious around the swimming pool. Uh, in any case, uh, covering crime was excellent preparation for going to Washington and writing about... <laughs> <laughs> and, and writing about uh, government uh, and politics and it's lately its intersection with uh, business as I have for a very long time. Uh, uh, I've done that um, uh, so long, in fact, um, that when I'm done with my presentation here today, uh, I would be more than happy to answer any questions you have. In fact, I hope to leave some time uh, in this really remarkable uh, political year to make sure that uh, I answer your questions. Uh, you, I bet you have one or two. Uh, I, I should point out that I am actually a native Pennsylvanian, so I know even more about the p upcoming Pennsylvania primary um, than probably you want to know, but I'm happy to. So I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have. Just hold them uh, till the end. I guess uh, I should be a little bit uh, careful about saying that I will answer your questions. After all, <laughs> I am from Washington, as I mentioned. Uh, we don't really answer questions uh, in Washington, as well you know. So how about if I pledge to uh, entertain your questions, if you have, <laughs> if you have any of those. Just uh, store them up, and I'll be happy to. Uh... <clears throat> well, let me tell you what uh, first, uh, it's not first. I've already been talking for a while. But uh, I want to thank you very much for the honor of uh, the invitation to speak to you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, you've had uh, quite a remarkable morning with some excellent pre uh, presentations, and uh, um, I hope to um, elaborate on some of the very good information that you got this morning uh, by uh, uh, trying to explain um, how we've gotten to the point we have at the moment uh, in politics, but also uh, with the economy. Uh, then to explain, at least as I see it, how the situation currently is playing itself out 
in both politics and um, in uh, the economy. And then I will pretend to put a little, uh, uh, I will pretend to, to see into the future. Now, just so you know, um, uh, in this uh, political year in particular, uh, the press at almost every turn has been absolutely wrong, just so you know. Uh, I like to, th to think of uh, uh, the press speaking very broadly, which is always a dangerous thing, but in general, this year, I think it's fair to say that we were a reverse indicator. Almost everything that the pollsters and the press predicted, uh, it came out to be um, uh, basically the opposite. Um, nonetheless, uh, in this, this third part of the speech, I will predict things with complete uh, and utter confidence, <laughs> um, as people from Washington are wont to do. So I will, I, I will speak uh, as if there was, were, was no doubt about what I am predicting, even though you now know that in all likelihood, I will be completely wrong. Uh, um, and then at the uh, very end, um, what I'd like to do is to make your life easier looking ahead to the November elections. Um, I would like to give you a cheat sheet, a very brief one, so that you too can become a Washington pundit. Uh, life is very, is very uh, busy, I know, and uh, it, uh, many of us are tired from lack of sleep, so what I would propose to do at the end is to give you a set of questions that you can answer, and if you're able to answer these questions, you will be able to go to sleep early on election night, knowing with confidence what the outcome will be the next day, and you will not have to stay up all night uh, watching, though if you do, I do recommend you watch Fox News, just so you know. Uh, but in any case, I'll try to give you a cheat sheet at the end. Now, some of you might be wondering how I can combine uh, both uh, economics and politics in the same speech. They, do, uh, they are two very different disciplines. Some people might say that uh, I think that they uh, are two disciplines that are not very disciplined. <laughs> Maybe that's what they have in common. But what they actually have in common, and I think you'll see uh, as I continue here, <clears throat> is that both operate in cycles. Um, if uh, any of you are more mathematically attuned, um, there is a sine curve, peaks and troughs, uh, to both of these disciplines. And I think <clears throat> that we are really at the moment uh, where <clears throat> the peaks and troughs are actually converging in both uh, that might make a, a little bit of sense um, in what uh, the title of my speech and uh, what I think you should think of um, is a look at recession politics. Um, those are two very nasty words put together, I guess, but uh, <laughs> that, I think, <clears throat> pretty well describes uh, the situation that we face uh, in addition uh, to the subject I'm going to be talking to you about now. So let's <clears throat> start um, with the first, how we got to this point. Um, I don't think we need to go back too far to uh, have a history lesson uh, to explain recession politics, the recession politics of today. Um, we just need to go back to the year 2000. Um, <clears throat> that was quite uh, an amazing time. Uh, it was, of course, less than eight years ago uh, when <clears throat> uh, the presidential election took place that year. Do you remember? It seems like about eight decades ago, I think. Uh, but it was, uh, certainly for people here in Florida, it was uh, quite an eventful time. <clears throat> but let me remind you about uh, the basic components. Um, it was uh, a presidential contest <clears throat> between Al Gore. Uh, you remember Al Gore. To the extent we think about him now, he, we are glad that he shaved his beard. And uh, he is now a Nobel laureate, of course. And it was against uh, George Bush, <clears throat> who we also know uh, well. Uh, but back then, I was working for Fortune magazine, which is an excellent publication. Um, but it is a, a publication usually of long-form journalism. In, in the case of 
the 2000 election, we tried to um, uh, squeeze, squeeze it down a little bit. Uh, we tried to encapsulate it actually in two pictures uh, and a conceit. The conceit was <clears throat> the Wizard of Oz election. Uh, and we pictured, literally, each of the candidates uh, as characters in The Wizard of Oz. <clears throat> That's right. <clears throat> I bet some of you are now thinking which characters they may be. We pictured uh, Al Gore as the Tin Man, and we said he was in search of a heart. Uh, the um, Fortune is an excellent publication, but not always a very nice one. Uh, and we put underneath his picture a gauge indicating how much in the public's mind, at least, uh, of a heart that Al Gore had. And I can see from the bright faces in the front here that some of you know that Fortune, an excellent publication, <coughs> um, <clears throat> pictured uh, the other candidate, George Bush, as the straw man or the scarecrow. And uh, we had him in search of a brain. Yes, we did. <clears throat> We put a, I, I will point out that only half the audience is applauding on that. <laughs> and we put a gauge underneath uh, his picture, um, indicating how much of a brain he had, at least in the public's mind. Um, and right before election day 2000, Fortune being an excellent publication, uh, had Bush ahead in the brains department compared to Gore in the heart department. And a mere 36 days later, we were proven to be exactly correct. Now do you remember the election of 2000 very well? <laughs> the Supreme Court had to tell us who our next president was going to be. And perhaps more important, um, we had reason to doubt whether our entire republic would stand, whether our system of government would, be, would hold together. It was a tremendously wrenching time. And I know uh, in, in Florida, it was all eyes were on you. But uh, in fact, the, it, it was a very serious moment. But it was not, by any stretch, the um, last wrenching moment in a very concentrated period back then. Nine months after the Supreme Court acted was September 11th, 2001, when everything was turned upside down. <clears throat> the, t the terrible attacks on that day uh, changed so much, and still, I think, uh, is changing things. But um, we all thought that we had a president who uh, believed in smaller, less activist government, but he, like the rest of us, embraced a larger activist government as the only way to combat global terrorists. Um, we all had a renewed belief in patriotism um, and in the power and importance of the federal government as the only place that could wage an international war against something amorph as amorphous as, uh, as terrorists. And despite what uh, we said at Fortune, an excellent publication, <laughs> about uh, George Bush, after September 11th, he clearly showed that he had what it took to sit in the Oval Office uh, and to wage uh, not just one, but two wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, in the first attack on our shores um, since uh, the revolution, um, uh, we had a very different view of Washington, uh, of our president, and it's fair to say of ourselves. But this was not the last wrenching change that we had to suffer in an extremely narrow frame of time. Three months after September 11th, the then nation's seventh largest corporation, Enron, went into bankruptcy court. And Enron became Enronitis, a disease, uh, an infection, if you will, that spread throughout 
uh, our entire corporate world. Um, to borrow a phrase from uh, the Wizard of Oz, even, uh, and to quote the wizard himself, um, uh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Well, when Enron happened, uh, investors, Americans of all kinds, uh, demanded that the veil be pulled back on U.S. corporations and the market economy, and they did not like what they saw. Uh, and the markets declined, and uh, a recession or a slowdown in the economy uh, began. And yet another fundamental part of our society was all of a sudden shaky. Now, it isn't very often in our history that so much happens all at once, whether, the, in this case, the government, in another case, um, the security of the nation, and in another case, um, the economy itself, the market economy, capitalism, was called into question all at once. This was a seminal time, in my view, um, and worth repeating uh, even now uh, eight decades, excuse me, eight years later, uh, for this reason. Um, in Washington, uh, politics is very important. Around the country, it, I, I think politics is basically the exchange of uh, the morning's headlines over the breakfast table, or uh, idle uh, gossip, if you will, or the exchange of opinions, basically, about who's right and who's wrong, what you think of the latest flap in the news. Uh, in Washington, uh, which is a company town, the company being the US government, politics is a very serious subject that has real meaning. And I, I, I'm not supposed to give out secrets like this, but I'm going to. You seem like a very nice audience. <laughs> I, uh, I could explain the way people who take politics seriously, what they think of politics, and it relates exactly to this period. Politics is what dictates to our government leaders what their priorities should be, what problems they should address first, and which second, and which third. Politics is the way that they see their mission, and it provides their mission statement, if you will. Um, and what is politics? It's dictated by the answer to this question. What do politicians care about most? Very good. This, we have an excellent student here. There are actually, in truth, sir, there are three things that politicians care about most. You might want to write this down. <laughs> they are getting reelected, getting reelected, and getting reelected. What can I say? You were right the first time. Um, um, and s politics, um, the most important day in Washington is election day, because that's the day when voters go to the polls and create our politics. When they, in the rough justice sort of way that elections do tell us things, they tell our elected leaders which of their of the problems that the nation faces should be their top priority and which other ones should come afterward. And even in a time when there were so many problems, as in the period that I just described, voters did provide this kind of guidance to Washington, and they continued to. But in the election of 2002, which followed this period, and in 2004, there was something of a sea change in politics-driven priorities. There was a split, and I think in some ways there continues to be a split, between the political parties about which is the top priority. Back in 2002, after this period, the Democrats took a very conventional tack. They said, uh, to quote the immortal James Carville, um, it's, it's, it's the economy, stupid. Meaning that what was most important were, were economic issues or domestic issues. 
The Democrats said in 2002, the first election after this period, vote for us and we will avenge the stolen election of 2000. And we will find a prescription for Enron-itis and economic woes. Vote for us and we will take care of domestic issues. Now, President Bush took a very different tack back then. He said, vote for, well, he couldn't say vote for me because he wasn't running in 2002, but vote for my party and we will provide you with protection, with safety, with security. Uh, vote for Republicans and we will take care of homeland security, something President Bush actually invented, created a whole new department on that subject. Um, uh, and national security, dealing with the wars overseas. Um, and that was a very different notion at the time. And the voters went to the polls, and on the margin, but without question, they chose the Republican path. Usually in an off-year election, the party that controls the White House loses seats in the House of Representatives, but that wasn't the case in 2002. The Republicans gained seats. They, after a time, maintained control of the Senate. And despite a lopsided disadvantage going into the election, they also kept a majority of the governor's seats around the country. So it was security stupid that, I'm not calling you stupid, you know what I'm saying here. <laughs> It's security that was most important. People decided that of the events or problems that they faced in this very narrow period of time, that it wasn't economic or domestic issues that were most important, but rather security that was most important. The senior issue, the most important problem, was international terrorism. People cared more about their own personal safety than how much money they had in their pockets. And that was a major change. Um, it was a change that continued into the 2004 election, which uh, pitted uh, George Bush against John Kerry. Do you remember John Kerry? To the extent we think of uh, Kerry now, we're glad, I guess, that he's not running again. Uh, no applause on that one at all. <laughs> That's all right. I was just, just, just kidding. Um, but he, as an indication of how important security uh, was in 2004, uh, in the uh, nominating convention for Kerry in Boston, he spent a lot of time there trying to remind the American public uh, that uh, he had been a hero in a war 30 years earlier, uh, the Vietnam War, a war that George Bush did not even attend, if you will. Uh, and because he had that credential, Kerry said that he could be the commander in chief uh, and George Bush should not be. Uh, but in fact, um, right before the election, you might remember a flight of ads put out by a group called the uh, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth which undercut his claim to heroism uh, and uh, cleared the way for security as the top uh, priority to sweep into re-election President Bush uh, without the aid of the Supreme Court because um, he in fact didn't have to prove that he could be the commander in chief, he was the commander in chief. So security was quite important. But here is where the cycle of politics and the cycle of economics begins to take its turn to explain exactly where we are today. I'm sure some of you were wondering when we were going to get to today. Don't worry. <laughs> it's right all here. We're going to get to it. I'm not kidding. Stick with me. I guess you don't have any choice. But um, um, in uh, 2005, um, the worm began to turn. Um, in the uh, late summer of that year, a massive hurricane 
Katrina came ashore in the Gulf of Mexico. And where the president had protected the nation convincingly, I think, uh, against an unforeseen and unseen, for the most part, uh, um, uh, disaster, he was unable, or rather his government was, to protect the American public from a completely predicted natural disaster, Katrina. Who can forget the anguished faces of Americans uh, abandoned in New Orleans for so long? Um, the wrenching thought of that is, is still burned in, in our memory. I have college-age children who called me and they were so upset about it. Um, the president's claim to security as his top priority, I think, was very much loosened from his grip because of his inability to deal with that issue. And that got worse, in my view, when the war in Iraq, rather than winding down, began to wind up, yes. Um, the number of US soldiers killed in Iraq exceeded the number of people who died in the attack on the World Trade Towers. And there was no end in sight. And there was also not much indication that all of the money and blood we had spent in Iraq was making the United States, or for that matter anyone else, uh, very much more secure. In short, what had been President Bush's badge of honor became an albatross around his neck. Security, which had been the issue that voters had said was their priority, was not an issue on which President Bush was delivering or his party was delivering. And the result was the election of 2006. Uh, an election um, that happens every 10 years or so, part of the cycle that is politics. It, uh, I th we, in politics, it's thought of as a wave election. Um, when, if you remember, of course, discontent with the Republican uh, Party swept out the longtime majorities uh, uh, in the House and the Senate of Republicans and brought in Democratic, new Democratic majorities instead. I, I like to think of it as actually more of the poltergeist election. <laughs> have, have any of you seen the movie Poltergeist? Everything that could go wrong goes wrong in that, in that movie. And for Republicans, it was the same thing in 2006. In the movie, um, the house shakes, the little girl is grabbed into the television set, dead people come out of the ground, you know, it's quite a scene. Well, that's what happened to the Republicans in 2006. They, uh, uh, you can applaud if you want, I wasn't, didn't, I didn't, <laughs> less than half of the audience on that one. Uh, in any case, uh, the uh, losing uh, security is the main issue, uh, all sorts of other problems came around, including uh, uh, corruption charges, uh, lobbyist Jack Abramoff, you might remember, and problems with uh, uh, a Florida Republican congressman from across the way, Mark Foley. Uh, we've just eaten, so I won't actually describe what uh, brought him down, but some of you might remember. Uh, in any case, the result was a big change, a very big change that I think has led to today. Now you can applaud. We're run to today. <laughs> we finally arrived. OK. Uh, <clears throat> the situation is now, uh, where does, do the voters go from here? Um, in my view, we're get, getting very, very close to the time when the sea change brought by President Bush is about to reverse itself in the cycle of both politics and economics. <laughs> this, this is becoming a contest today. <laughs> the, um, I think without question, if you look at the polls, the uh, voters believe that it is the economy, stupid again, that they care most about. Uh, the burst 
housing bubble, uh, the uh, follow-on crisis with credit, uh, not very much uh, money available uh, to borrow or to lend, um, a tripling of the cost of oil, and inflation in all sorts of other commodities uh, has put us into what a number of respected economists now say is a recession. Now, I don't want to uh, say that we are in a recession for sure because a recession uh, officially is two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. Uh, we've not seen that yet, but by almost all indications uh, today, there are even more numbers out about uh, declines in uh, new housing, um, the uh, consumer spending, which is two-thirds of the gross domestic product is essentially flat. Uh, in all likelihood, um, we are in a recession right now. And more importantly, from the perspective of political economics, um, almost everybody, I mean a very large number of people, say that their number one issue is the economy and what to do about it. And uh, that's what the presidential candidates are now talking about uh, in great volume and with tremendous frequency in a way that they once spoke about security. Um, uh, I think that we are now, have reached yet another stage in the cycle of politics where the economy is the number one issue and that's what matters most. And another way to think of, about it is recession politics because we are clearly at or nearing the bottom of an economic cycle uh, and uh, it is what politicians are focusing on, especially those running for president. Um, in that way, uh, uh, both parties, I think, offer extremely different views about how to get out of uh, a recession. <laughs> and both are probably exaggerated and wrong, this being politics, but nonetheless, they will present a very different uh, 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 vantage for voters to choose. Yesterday, uh, John McCain tried for the third time to give an economic speech that someone might accept, <laughs> given, <laughs> given the tremendous decline of the economy. And uh, he uh, hit on a combination that will probably be successful for him. Um, he proposed, you might have seen, a uh, gas tax holiday between uh, uh, Memorial Day and Labor Day. It will be a success in all likelihood because A, it does address the question that a lot of people are worried about, which is the very high price of gasoline, one of the reasons that, the, uh, that, that we were probably in recession. Um, second, it allows him to claim that he is, in fact, a tax cutter, which is something Republicans have to be, even though John McCain voted against both of President Bush's major tax cuts early in his administration. And third, because his proposal is very unlikely to be accepted or uh, become law, and therefore he can uh, run against everybody uh, and claim the issue because no one will actually pass it and take it away from him. <laughs> Um, the Democrats, but, but beyond that, to be quite serious if I can, uh, McCain will be running um, on, uh, as a tax cutter and also as a fiscal conservative. The Democrats, and I will refer to the, uh, the nominee from the Democratic Party as the Democrats because uh, I don't think uh, Hillary Clinton will ever uh, concede. So, so, so I will refer to them as the Democrats. Uh, uh, are running um, uh, on uh, a very activist government, which includes spending, uh, extra spending on many programs, uh, tax increases, but only on upper income people, presenting a very different point of view. And uh, apropos of today's uh, conference, their view on trade is also almost diametrically opposite. Uh, the Republicans, including McCain, are pressing for free trade, 
of uh, almost every kind. Uh, the Democrats uh, are opposed even to a free trade agreement with Colombia, which is the latest, uh, of course, which is a remarkable position in my view, uh, because already Colombia is able to import into this country without any tariffs, but the United States faces tariffs in Colombia, which the Colombia Free Trade Agreement would reduce. <clears throat> so it's only for our advantage, uh, basically, uh, the Colombia Free Trade. So <coughs> it is essentially free trade versus protectionism, giving very different ideas for the American public to decide uh, who will vote for whom. Um, <clears throat> will this lead to a return to economic growth? Um, luckily, we do not have to depend on politicians to return to economic growth. Uh, it will probably return on its own. I think in all likelihood, uh, not for a while. Uh, clearly, the housing market has a way to, to decline before it hits bottom. Um, there uh, continues to be a serious inflation problem with commodities, including oil. And uh, as the head of one major private equity firm told me recently, um, the problems with the secondary mortgage market means there are about $1 trillion worth of securities out there that nobody knows how to value. Uh, that's a severe market dislocation that will take a while for, uh, to, be, to work its way out. But I do think that the government, to the extent that it has passed stimulus ideas, the checks that are in the mail, literally for May, $150 billion worth, uh, will help. There will be more money uh, to help uh, those people who face uh, foreclosures soon. And that should soften the blow uh, of recession. Nonetheless, uh, we are probably in one. The, the most important question. Uh, that we now face is whether the recession and poor economic times will last into the fall and affect our politics again. Um, if this slowdown begins to reverse itself over the summer, uh, then the chances of a Republican we winning the White House again uh, will be much improved. If the economy declines or continues to decline, then a Democrat is much more likely to win, or the Democrats, whichever. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it is the economy that's most important, reversing the trend of the last few years. So let me just f finish with the cheat sheet that I promised to give you. Um, they are just really three numbers, all right? Uh, remember, this is a cheat sheet. If you answer these questions on election day, you will be able to go to sleep early and know who the victor is the next day. The first number is 30. If President Bush's job approval rating is below 30 percent on election day, chances are that the next day you will wake up and see both a Democratic Congress and a Democratic President. The next number is one. If the uh, economic growth rate is 1% or less on election day, then you are likely to wake up again with a Democrat in the White House and Democrats in charge of Congress. And then the third number is a combination of those two numbers, <clears throat> 130,000. If the number of US soldiers in Iraq is still in that range and not much below it, then you'll have the same uh, outcome. Of course, if it's uh, much lower than that, then I'm afraid, in, in other words, also, if Bush is at 30 or better percent, if gr the growth rate has returned to over 1 percent, or if much fewer than 130,000 soldiers are there, I, I'm afraid that means that you're going to be losing sleep on election night. Now, <clears throat> let me just end with this. I have been uh, in Washington long enough that I am a member in good standing of the fraternity of political journalists. And we actually know who's going to win. 
<clears throat> Unfortunately, as a condition of maintaining that membership, I can't tell you. <laughs> but with the exception of that question, I would be very happy to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> At a time when the economy was very good and the housing market was very good, and since then the economy has declined, do you see any relationship between more liberal <clears throat> legislation and a, a declining economy? Oh, so it's the Democrats' fault. Is that? <laughs> I see. I'm I see. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I was just trying to. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think on your part that's wishful thinking, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, it is the president who is generally blamed or given credit for more than he deserves either direction for the state of the economy. That's just the way politics is. So, the, but I, I don't, uh, I'm, not, I'm unaware of any, well, I'm an, uh, unaware of almost any action that the Democratic Congress took. Uh, so it's hard for them to, <laughs> So it's hard to blame them for the decline of the economy. Yes? There will be at some point in time a reasonable conclusion to the war in Iraq, whatever reasonable, whatever form that will take. I think there certainly will be uh, some time, but not uh, any time soon. Uh, I, I take President Bush at his word. I. I I, I don't agree with uh, Fortune, though, an excellent publication. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Bush is a very able uh, and uh, very forthright uh, fellow. If he says that uh, in all likelihood uh, that it's not wise to get out of Iraq soon, then it probably isn't. Um, I do think that the Democrats, when they win, if they win, uh, we'll try to get out faster, but even they will not withdraw as quickly as their uh, uh, campaign rhetoric would have us believe, uh, because it could create a uh, chaotic situation that would be worse for them uh, than uh, fulfilling campaign promises. I know it's hard to imagine this, but uh, politicians do not always tell the truth. <laughs> I sh don't tell anyone I said that. This is a very clever, clever attempt. I just. <laughs> um, I think that uh, uh, the parlor game of deciding uh, vice presidential candidates um, is fun, uh, but not productive now, uh, because that decision is very often made late. Uh, at, at least the smart candidates uh, decide late because they. Uh, try to, to guess what the key issues are, um, and uh, even more importantly, the Democrats' uh, convention is first, and then the Republicans. So John McCain would be well uh, advised to wait to see who the Democrats choose as the vice presidential candidate. I, I guess th what I'm suggesting is that like, there'll be three people running from the Democratic side in this case. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that he could counter in some way. So th these are decisions that, uh, that very much depend on the events of the time and who's available at the time. So it's a little, but, but um, uh, I, I do think that uh, Condi Rice, for example, is on the list for John McCain, but that doesn't mean that she'll be selected. Yes. You, you, everyone likes your question, so. <clears throat> yes, it is a good question. Um, in, um, if you were to follow my theory, to, remember my theory is likely wrong, just so you know, I mentioned that to begin with. Uh, but nonetheless, I will say with great confidence uh, that, um, that in fact the one number there that is likely to go well for Republicans uh, is the number of soldiers. In fact, a lot of people do expect uh, that uh, to help John McCain, 
uh, President Bush will be more than happy to reduce the number of soldiers below 130,000, maybe significantly so, um, in time for the election. Um, but following the reasoning that I suggested that there has been a switch in what is the top priority, that that is the wrong number to change for the Republicans. The one they need, really, is the one. They need a better economy in order to preserve uh, control of the White House. Um, but um, uh, it will be an advantage, nonetheless, for the Republicans if uh, things continue to do better in Iraq uh, and that the U.S. can uh, reduce its presence there in a noticeable way before the election. It will make this more of a contest, uh, in my view. Have you calculated what my grandchildren will pay to, uh, for my $600 rebate I'm going to get? I'm sure someone has. <laughs> and it's more than $600. <laughs> uh, although I have to say uh, that economically speaking, um, spending uh, in the red, deficit spending, uh, is a good idea if you're trying to jumpstart an economy. I know that that is counterintuitive, perhaps, but it is true. Uh, that, and, and that's one reason why I do believe that the $150 billion or so that will be flowing in checks directly into people's pockets uh, over the next few months will help cushion uh, the pain from uh, the recession. First of all, you accused, right. accused me of having Washington wisdom. <laughs> this is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> uh, I can say with uh, confidence, right? Um, uh, I, I, I think that we are probably in the upward uh, range of the price of oil. Uh, that. Uh, I want to know what happened to OPEC. Weren't they supposed to prevent this from happening? Yeah. Uh, that they didn't want to burn out the et in entire uh, international economy and uh, uh, kept the, the price of oil, as I remember it, at $30 a barrel. <laughs> Never even, ne it, would, it was unthinkable to go to 50, wasn't it? Uh, maybe I'm just too old uh, for me to remember this. In any case, I, do, I don't think that, uh, uh, I, I think there, there will be s severe uh, dislocations if it gets too much more expensive, so something will be done to prevent it from happening. Um, uh, and there have been lots of visits to Saudi Arabia recently by American uh, officials. Um, you don't see them because they're, uh, the officials are mostly on their knees begging, uh, <laughs> but, there, but there is uh, I, I think we've we've about reached our level of toleration for that. Uh, that's Washington wisdom for you. Well, I have to disagree with most of what uh, what was in your question. Uh, I. I if, if we had ample energy, we wouldn't uh, have $100 a barrel oil. Uh, if uh, the, the notion of a comprehensive energy policy uh, gives far too much credit to the federal government and uh, too much uh, responsibility uh, to it for uh, taking care of a very important uh, private matter, uh, which is uh, what uh, the, the energy industry does to provide us with, uh, with uh, a variety of ways to create uh, electricity and other things. So um, as I remember it, in fact, uh, we've had energy bills of massive size, at least two of them, pass in Congress and be signed into law. Um, uh, and I think, in fact, in all likelihood, uh, a number of the benefits that went to oil companies uh, in, the, in those pieces of legislation will be taken back. So if what you're suggesting, we're going to end up in a fist fight here at the end, I think. Uh, 
if, especially if um, a Democrat wins the White House, what you may be thinking of as necessary to be part of a uh, an energy, a comprehensive energy policy, uh, a lot of that will be dismantled rather than uh, than extended. And to the extent there are uh, energy incentives, they will not go to traditional forms of energy, but rather to alternative fuels. To have a package of some sort, because they did call the bank, they did want to refinance their house, they just want to extend the time, don't they? Well, I, I, so, don't, I don't want to speak uh, to the, the specific problem of your son, uh, yeah. uh, but uh, the, uh, beca um, but the answer is yes. There will be, in all likelihood, uh, a major uh, bill to help people who are credit worthy um, restructure their loans if they are facing uh, possible foreclosure. At the moment, it, uh, th this is a prediction that goes beyond the situation right now, just so you know. Um, President Bush uh, has opposed the creation of a fund to do this. Um, but the House of Representatives shortly is likely to approve such a fund. Uh, the Senate has passed a bill that does not include it. Um, my expectation is that because the housing market will get worse rather than better, the pressure will be so strong that some version of a uh, fund to help people near foreclosure will pass and the President will reluctantly sign it. Um, and so there will be relief available uh, to, to people, but it will not be right away and it won't be uh, without some uh, compromise. I wonder if you'd be willing to comment on the current position of the U.S. and the global economy compared to what you think it was, let's say, back in the year 1999 or This is a pop quiz. <laughs> Well, clearly, the United States uh, has uh, fallen as a uh, international power as measured by the value of the dollar. Uh, uh, there's no clearer uh, sign that the uh, U.S. Is no, is no longer what it once was. Um, I, I think I, I, I could afford to go to Europe uh, in 2000. In, well, 1999, 2000 was an election year. I didn't go anywhere. Uh, except everywhere. Does that make any sense? Uh, but uh, um, but now uh, going o going uh, to to Europe or almost anywhere other than uh, Latin America, South America is uh, not uh, a very uh, um, a smart economic move. And I think that that does uh, that that tells us what we need to know about the falling fortunes of the U.S. on the international scene. <laughs>